Pastor Allen, and I'm here today with Scott Hamilton. What a privilege, Scott, to have you back at the church. The honor is mine. <laughs> it really is. Thanks for having me. I feel like I am talking. I know I'm, I'm not just feel like it. I'm talking to somebody that I watched on television. You mm-hmm. and you helped me understand ice skating probably more than anybody else I've ever met. Well, a lot of people don't know that you were my target audience. Yeah. No, honestly, I always pay attention. <laughs> you like, mean uncoordinated Southern no, people that no, never it, saw ice? <laughs> no, it was like when I was competing, I watched all the skaters around me make horrific mistakes. And it's like, okay, don't do that. Right. Don't do that. Don't do that. Definitely don't do that. And do more of this. Right. And then when I turned pro, I, you know, I was always excited to get out in front of an audience and I would peek out the curtain to see what was going on. And I'd always see men sitting in the audience with their arms crossed, looking around, making sure that um, none of their friends could see them on date night at the ice skating <laughs> show. Right. Then they'd be checking their watch and it'd be like, all that. So I figured if I could earn their respect. If I could make figure skating entertaining and appealing to men, that I could skate forever if I wanted to, because they're like totally underserved, right? So <laughs> now, after all those years that I skate, as 20 years as a professional skater, um, which is insane to me because I finally just ran out of gas and I had to quit, but um, I'll be in airports and a man will come up to me and they go, are you that skater? And I go, yes, sir. And he goes, well, I, I, don't, I don't watch skating. I know I'm a football guy and you know, I'm into all those, you know, I don't watch, but my wife loves it. Can I introduce you? And I go, absolutely. And so... Gentleman will come back with his wife and and say, honey, look who I found. And she'll take one look at me and she'll say, uh, I have no idea that is. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, I win. All right. So, you know, it is, it's just reaching out to, you know, all those people that are are stuck or in a building and and making it so that they can enjoy it. And then it it just makes everything better, right? Well, if that was your target, you hit it. Because true oh, confessions, if skating was on and you were doing the commentary, I'd watch. If oh, you weren't, I'd ship you. over to football or something I understood. No, that was a whole nother muscle I had to build because, um, you know, Dick Button was always the guy for every Olympics. Dick yes. Button was the guy. And then CBS took over the Olympics and I was their guy just doing all their pro events and everything. And so now I'm in the chair that Dick Button sat in all for every Olympics ever televised. And Did you get hate mail? I got a lot of hate mail. There was I, I had a binder this thick with every note, everything. I just did, I powered it. I did my homework. I knew every skater, everything, everything. I, did, I had a line for every moment. I was all scripted and everything. And they absolutely hated me. Absolutely hated me. The, the, the reviews were so vile that CBS like didn't even have a bulletin board. They normally have a bulletin board with everything that's being said. They took it all down. And I'm, I'm, I'd walk into the, what's going on? Go, nothing, nothing. It's okay. They wanted to guard me from a, you know, this collapse. So finally I heard about it. I asked Vern Lundquist, my broadcast partner about it. And he goes, yeah, don't worry about it. It's just, it's just hate mail. Don't worry about it. And it's like, okay, fine. So we sat down for the men's event. I took my binder I threw it in the trash. I looked at Vern, and for every single Olympic Games, every night of the Olympics from then on, I said, I got nothing. <laughs> and Vern just looked at me, his eyes got really big, and I go, I'm gonna do my job and just react and be the expert that you've hired me to be. And from then on, it just was so much fun just to be able to react to what was happening in front of me. And as someone who participated in that, I was able to do that much better with, than it being scripted and all kind of... Well, it felt know. that way. Yeah. It, it felt like it was coming out of your heart. It was fun. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. So who's the most fun person to work with broadcasting? Uh, Vern, Vern Lundquist, Uncle Vern. Uncle Vern, they put all of the um, the guys that needed to learn how to be a broadcaster with Vern because he could teach them and he was really... They call him Uncle Vern because he's kind of that avuncular kind of guy, right? Yeah. And he just, man, we just hit it off. We had the best time. And he fell in love with skating. It was his favorite sport. In fact, he wrote his memoirs and he's doing all these football interviews and go, if you could do one sport and sit next to anybody one more time, who would it be? <laughs> he said me. And it's like, <laughs> well, that's yes. awesome. No, because he just, everything about it, the the athleticism, the drama, the art form, the music, he loved everything every single aspect of it. And he loved the personalities and he, and just the idea that someone is absolutely alone on a massively slippery surface and they had to navigate that in order to rise to the occasion. It's just, it, he, he, he got it. He got it better than anybody I've ever worked with. That is awesome. You've had an amazing life. 
Well, I mean, you. world championships, better gold than I deserve, medals. That's for sure. Well, we, everything we have is better than what we deserve. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> you know, I talk to people a lot that are trying to climb the ladder. And you climbed the ladder, found the mountain next to it, climbed the mountain, and then got a ride on a hot air balloon further. I mean, it's yeah. amazing to me what you have accomplished. That but, balloon's been popped a few times. Yeah, well, it's not easy. But I think for people that would listen to this talk, um, I want to talk to them just a minute about what that's like to have that kind of success. Because it's not a bad thing. Uh, it's it's something to navigate. You know, it it um It just came easy to you, right? No problems, no, no, no hassles. No, I definitely, you know, I was just I, a lot of physical I was gears. the uh, baseball cap, you know, sunglass guy, you know, just trying I didn't know how to handle all these people looking at me and knowing everywhere I went. I was you know, I, when I went to the Olympics in nineteen eighty four, I was relatively unknown. Like in the skating circles, I just went for three years undefeated and so I kind of built some momentum and all that. But in, in, in you know, there's, there's just the world, you know, outside of skating, really, I was relatively unknown. And so I went through Chicago on the way to Sarajevo, and I was, re I, I like to read just to kind of relax, take my mind off things. And I was reading, and I lost track of time, and I was like, <gasps> I didn't want to miss my flight, right? Because my coach is always at the gate, and I just want to, don't want to be at the gate, you know? So I asked a guy, um, I, excuse me, what time is it? And he looked at me, and he kind of like, <clears throat> and he kept walking, and I was like, I'm on my way to the Olympic Games and I cannot get the time of day <laughs> from somebody. Are you kidding me? Two and a half weeks later, I came back and I went to baggage claim and I signed autographs for two and a half hours for these wow. school trips that were on their way to Washington or on their way back from Washington. And it was just like night and day. And then from then on, it was just, how do I, how do I navigate this? You know, because... It, it's it's hard, and it's um you know I'm you know I, I you make a lot of mistakes. You feel unworthy of all of it, and and it's just one of those things where it, it's a season that you know it's like the best I've ever heard was um uh, uh, Barry Gibb from the Bee Gees, and he said if you can survive first fame, you're probably going to be okay. And first fame is toxic. You know, it's it's all the stuff that, you know, the enemy loves. You know, it's going to put you in touch with this. And you're going to, now you're going to be steeped in that. And now you're going to have all this and all that. And and it's just, it's it, it doesn't, it, it offends, you know, who you're supposed to be. And then once you're able to kind of survive that first fame and then get into like second or whatever, third or fourth or whatever that is next, you're much more comfortable in that position and you're able to do good things with it. But until then, it's just, you feel like you're just take, 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 take. And it's right. just people running you and it's just having to respond, you know, to crazy things. Um, there's a story I heard and um, I'm going to tell it on when, you know, I, I talk on, and it's uh, a, a friend of mine knows Bill Murray, like Bill Murray stories are everywhere, right? Yeah. And so he was having uh, dinner with Bill Murray. They got to be friends through uh, um, fundraising activities. And of course, everybody interrupts, right? So they're having dinner and somebody walks up and says, hey, Billy, what's it like to be rich and famous? <laughs> and honestly, this is what he did. He stopped. And it must have been 30 seconds. And it was this really uncomfortable pause. I mean, he's theatrical. He knows what was going on. It was just like this thing. And he was really thinking about the response. And he said, try rich first. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer. No, but think about that. You know, it's like it's unnatural for everybody to, to know you. And it's gotten to be something now that I, I embrace. I love meeting new people. I love hearing about them and what they're up to and what their challenges are and interacting with cancer patients and you know how they're feeling and how they're enduring and and trying to give them the support they need. And and it's it's all of it. I, I really enjoy it. I don't shy away from it anymore. And I fly Southwest, so that's gonna happen <laughs> no matter what. A lot. Yeah. So you said you need you have to survive that first fame. Did you have the tools? No. Or did you have to develop them? I had to develop them. You know, I had to get knocked down a few times. You know, I was fired from my escapades because they didn't want male skaters. You know, <laughs> you know, it was a new owner came in and said, I don't want any men. I just want women. You know, get rid of them. So I had to build a tour. I built a tour and that was doing really well. And then I was diagnosed with cancer. And that was the fork in the road. That was where God really just stopped me in my tracks and said, are you going to go left? Or are you going to go right? And I just had to choose what I needed to do. I, need, I knew I needed to be alone for a while. So I had what I call my adventure, my wilderness period. 
And I, I just sort of just disconnected as much as I could. And then um, three years to the day I was diagnosed with cancer, I would meet the woman that would become my wife, you know? So, and in there, you know, she kind of said what every man needs to hear from their um, bride-to-be. And that is, um, before we go any further, I need to know where you are in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Wow. And I said what any smart guy would say. I go, where do you want me to be? <laughs> but he's <laughs> always, you know, I mean, I look back and I, I see, I see it all now. Because when you have that kind of awakening, you kind of understand where he's been and how he's operated in your life. And I, I almost feel like there's a, like someone sitting in the car seat next to me all the time and just fending off bad things and making sure that you know I'm okay, you know, and throughout, you know, whenever I hit these crossroads, you know, I just, it was like, okay, re- here's this. I'm whispering in your ear now and you need to understand, you know, it's like praying, you know, I'd, 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 I'd be, I'd pray in gratitude. I would never ask for anything. Hmm. And then there was this nurse that was in my room in Boston after my surgery, brain surgery didn't go well. And I was scared and I was, you know, I, I just didn't know what to do. And, and she came in and she was not of this world. She was kind of different. She had an accent and her name was odd, you know, and I was thinking, I, to this day, I think it was an angel. I don't think it's a real person. And she asked what I was doing. I said, I'm praying. And she goes, well, how do you pray? And I told her how I prayed. And she goes, oh, so um, who is God to you? And I go, I, wow. I go, I guess he's my father. He goes, are you a father? And I go, I am. And she said, if one of your children were at risk or scared or needing any help, wouldn't you want them to come to you? And I said, yes. And it changed the way I, I pray now. I, I pray in faith and I pray in, in just, you know, help me with this. Help me with that. Support me. Strengthen me. Allow me to endure this season. And um, the peace that comes from that is unbelievable. But it took one of those angels that comes into your life to just straighten the path a little bit. Absolutely. Wow. So learning to pray. I want to. I want to come back to cancer. But I want to step back just a minute. If I could put somebody in this chair and give you two minutes with them, that life is on a trajectory up, mm-hmm. success and good things come into them, and looks like a lot of momentum, mm-hmm. and you were going to coach them into that season. What would you say to them? Well, there are a couple things. Um, one is understand the opportunities that are coming and. Uh, the opportunities that are coming is you're going to be given um, recognizability and you're going to be given influence. Whatever money comes from this, money goes fast. It just comes and it goes. It, it's, it doesn't even really exist. It's fluid. But what you can do in this in this time is truly and remarkably affect other people in profound ways. I didn't really know that. I was given the tools for that. And the other, and you know the other thing uh, I would say is beware. Hmm. Beware. You know, I, I uh, there's this uh, sports reporter from the Chicago Tribune that calls me, you know, all the time. I need a quote. I need a quote. I need a quote. So he called me when Michael Phelps the the picture went viral of him, you know, in London and he was and and he goes, "I I need a quote." And I go, "You're not going to use it." And he goes, uh, what do you mean I'm not going to use it? I go, you're not going to use it. And he goes, I'll use it. I'll use it. I go, okay. And he goes, if Michael Phelps was standing in front of you right now, what would you tell him? And I would say, don't get caught. <laughs> no, it's like, we're all boneheads. We right. all do things. We all make mistakes. We all get caught up in the moment. We all get pulled off our path. And we just got to figure out a way for that moment not to define Next. Just the famous people get photographed. Right. The rest of us get to live in anonymity. Don't be a bonehead. Yes. <laughs> right? It's like, yes. so it's like you need for those those angels in your life to kind of, you know, almost cocoon you and, and to prevent you and to remind you and to um, embolden you to, to kind of make good choices. But if I, in listening to you, it seems to me that, you know, you can develop your physical skills or your ability to make money or whatever your arena is. But if you don't do the character development and the spiritual development to go with it, 
it's almost impossible to sustain it. Well, you, you know, you're on um, a journey without a map. Right. You know, you're, you're just, you're, you know, you're just in the breeze. You're just floating around, just banging into walls. You know, you're just, you're not tethered to anything. And once I, I, I got tethered, the peace that comes from that is just remarkable. I mean, it's just like, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. When a brain tumor comes, I'm okay. You know, when I had to tell my wife that the first, first brain tumor came, she didn't even take a beat. Not even a beat. She just, you know, not, not, oh, what are you, are you feeling? Nothing. It was just like, dear Lord. And she just started to pray. And it was, woof, wow. I mean, I wasn't even baptized yet when that happened. And it was just like, this is it. This is, this is real. And every message that came to me after that was more of this is where you need to be. This is where you find your strength. This is how you're going to endure this. And it was remarkable. It was just um, like Ray Lewis, of all people. I'm watching and I was going in for the, the biopsy where they found a safe corridor to go into my brain and pull a piece of this tumor out. You know, <clears throat> I was at the lowest I think I've ever been. I was scared out of my mind because they tell you all the bad things that'll happen. You know, you motor, you, know, you, you won't walk, you can't speak, you won't remember people. You, you know, all these things are going to happen if they make a mistake or if it doesn't go well. And I heard him do a quote, you know, just somebody was mocking him. Somebody was trying to pull him away from his game and trying to make him respond in kind. And he just said, hey, 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 you know, I, don't need, I don't need to be doing that. I pray for that person. And he said, because as deep as I have dug down low, that's as high as I'm going to go. Mm. And I've never forgotten that ever because that's it. We're going to get low. We're going to get really low. And for all those lows, I used to think from every high, a low is coming next. And now the Lord's taught me that for every low, a high is coming next. So even though I go back consistently for these scans and the brain tumor that likes an encore, I always liked an encore and my brain tumor likes an encore. It's like, I'll do whatever I need to do. And, and whatever's next, you know, after the first brain tumor, I became a father for the second time, impossibly, because when you have testicular cancer, and then a pituitary brain tumor, fertility is not really, you know, not really, you know, going to work. And I self-injected, I did all the medical stuff, and then we stopped and prayed. And I stopped everything, and I just prayed. And um, two months later, we were expecting our second son. After mm. two years of self-injecting and trying to do it worldly, we went to, to the Lord, and He blessed us with a second child. And then after this second brain tumor, we adopt two children from Haiti. And, you know, and then the third brain tumor comes, and I— and, the Lord just slammed on the brakes. He said, all I know, I don't know where the voice came from. I don't, it wasn't an audible voice, but all I felt was get strong. And so I would oh, get strong. I don't know <laughs> where to get strong. And so I didn't know if it was physical, emotional, mental, spiritual. And so I decided all of the above was a really good idea. Amen. And so I just got healthier. You know, I, I got healthier. I'm, 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 all day trying to take in as much information as I possibly can the best way I know how to do it. I love, there's so many great, you know, leaders, you know, great faith leaders in our country that just, you know, that are out there and sharing their message. Like you share your message. You are such a calm in the storm. And, and what you bring is a learned understanding that can really allow people to know that coming to the Lord is a safe and honorable place. He just makes life better. He does. He, he does. does. Because, you know, in it, there's hope. There's no hope without Jesus. It's the truth. Where our bodies are fragile, resilient, but ultimately temporary. I like your perspective about the lows in life. You know, because at this season of my life, it seems like the lows are the preparation for the breakthroughs. Yeah. You know, they're not something to be avoided. <laughs> it's in those lows where something happens in you that prepares you for the, the better things that are coming. Jesus was tested. Yeah. It's, it's always good to go back to him, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it's like he, he endured all the things that we are meant to endure. We are not necessarily meant to endure what he had to and what he did for us, but he gave us everything we need to know in order to live this life better. Amen. Just better. And he'll help us where we are. We don't have to become something else. We don't have to hide something from him. No. In fact, there's nothing in our lives hidden, and he still loves us. 
which is amazing because it feels like me. We spend our lives hiding parts of us from everybody else. <laughs> And God knows the real truth. Yeah, and I'm he not still ready to let that one out yet. <laughs> but he knows. You know, and again, it comes down to confession, you know, repentance and redemption, you know. It, it's, but confessing to somebody that already knows is not scary. Yeah. I mean, if we could ever get that in our head, that nothing is really hidden from God. Coming to him, it's like if when you know your kids have, you know, been eating cookies and you told them not to. If they come and confess, it's endearing. It makes you want to give them a hug. Yeah. Because you know it already. And that's where the grace comes from, right? Yes. And we don't have to be afraid of God. He says we can come to Him in our time of need, not when we're perfect. Yeah. You know, I usually want to show up when I feel like I've read my Bible and I'm prayed up and I haven't cussed in 30 minutes. <laughs> but God said I can come when my heart's in the worst place yeah. and find grace. So that's good. Thank you for that. Mm. You, you gave a little coaching to our successful folks listening. I want to flip it. If I had to describe your life, one word I would use is an overcomer. Mm. I mean, from your childhood until today, you have had to overcome stuff. Yeah, yeah. Hurdles and obstacles. So I'm sure there's some people going to listen to this talk that are having to, to face some stuff that they never thought they'd have to face. I mean, you um, you lost your mom with cancer. Mm -hmm. Cancer has been a recurring story in your life. Mm -hmm. You've had some tremendous successes and some low spots. So what are you going to say to those folks that are having to overcome? It's not... You know, I learned this from Eric Hyden in 1980. Um, it was in a, a newspaper quote article, whatever. He said, it's not the events in your life that define your character. It's how you respond to them, you know? And it's good or bad, good or bad, you know? And and it was really odd. It, it convicted me because, you know, through all my life, I was kind of like this bouncing off the wall kid that was really kind of, you know, um, you know, again, the unguided missile. And, and I like to do what I like to do. I didn't like to do figures. I hated them. So I just wasn't very good at them, you know, and then you know, I would kind of do okay. And then I, and then I do better and then not. And then, you know, it was kind of like, I just, once I got to the national level, I was an epic disaster. Right. <laughs> and then, um, my mother was diagnosed with cancer and she gave me one year left to skate because they were broke. And so I went back, my coach had retired, my normal coach. And there was a new coach that was kind of a crack whipping game play and you know, taskmaster, disciplinarian guy. And I was like, what have I got to lose? It's my last year. And so I went from my best placement in nationals. I went last, next to last, and then I beat two guys in nationals. That's the best I ever did. And then I went that year and uh, I won junior nationals. And it was, my mom was there with a wig on because she lost her hair to chemo and her left breast was removed. And so she was in a sling so people wouldn't bump into her. And, um, she was just light. She was just so happy. And she was the center of my universe, like the absolute. I loved her more than anybody on the planet. And I just adored my mom. And um, and then um, because I went junior nationals, I got a sponsor in the next year. Um, I went to nationals and I call it the trifecta. I was 18, sponsored and got my own apartment. <laughs> you know, it's next, it's right? Year. Yeah, that was bad fail. That was a, a really bad one. But, the, you know, the worst thing about that, and I talk about it all the time when I speak, is that was the last time my mother ever saw me skate in competition. Mm. And when I lost her, I went on a walk. And in that walk, I was like, I'd seen people succumb to um, almost uh, self-destruction, you know, out of mourning and, and grief. And I said, that doesn't seem like that would be what she'd want me to do. And so um, that voice in my head said, honor her. And so I, every time I went to the rank, it's like, oh, uh, I'm going to be late for figures. Nope, honor her. So I was on time. I worked harder. Okay. It's like, I don't want to do a long program run through today because I don't really feel like, you know, exerting myself. Honor her. Do the long program run through competition, you know, energy. And it was in that, in, in honoring her and trying to be the person that she always thought I could be that things just turned rapidly from that ninth place finish at nationals when she saw me skate. It was third at nationals, 11th in the world the next year. And um, two years later, I'm on the Olympic team. And then um, after the Olymp after the 80 Olympic year, I, I went four years undefeated. And it was like, honor her, do this. And you build those muscles of showing up every day with an intention of making your life better, showing up every day with the idea that, um, that y you know, y there are people that have sacrificed for you. There, there are, you know, there has sacrifice been made for you and you need to honor that sacrifice. And in that, you build those muscles of 
of expectation and um, inspiration and, you know, aspiring to be better than you've ever been before. And it, and it kind of showed up and worked because I'm unlikely, like very unlikely. I grew up in a small town without coaching, without much ice time, without any of that stuff. And, you know, I just figured it out, you know, through responding to those horrific times with just putting my head down and doing the work. But I love your word choice of those attributes of attitude or muscles Yeah, that have to be exercised and developed. And the little muscles are the most important <clears throat> ones. A lot of people don't recognize that when you get on, you know, you, you'll have a, like, a, you know, a football player, a guy that's, you know, got just muscles on muscles, and you know, put them on the ice, and they're just, are, you know, they just are, they're in a yard sale, right, you know? And it's those little coordinating muscles that support the big muscles that you need to develop over time. And those little muscles, they take a lot of attention. The little muscles are ones that you really need to rely on when, you know, you, you want those big muscles to do the work. Right. So there's, a, you know, a lot of analogies in that, but, you know, if I'm off the ice, when I, when I was in training, if I was off, off the ice two days, I felt it. Wow. So my coach wanted me, my, he wanted my feet to be on the ice. Um, if they, I couldn't be off the ice more than 24 hours ever. And in that way, I was able to keep those little muscles firing. And, and it's the same with anything, practicing anything, practicing faith, practicing piano, practicing, um, you know, just being aspirational in your work. You know, I just want to, I want to be, I want to do, I want to, I want to do something with this life that's, you know, um, beyond my, you know, my, my place, right. And we, beyond what is expected. And once you kind of start doing that, it, everything changes. When somebody looks at my life, I want them to think somebody had to help him, that the outcome exceeded the, the sum of the parts that they can see. Mm-hmm. You know, if God didn't help me, That's my so life true. is impossible. Right. I had a friend, uh, Sir Lionel LeCou. He used to say he was a turtle on a fence post. <laughs> yes, he <laughs> got there somehow. Somebody had to help him. <laughs> mm. But I, I think your your idea that the disappointments of life aren't reasons to quit, but reasons to start exor- exercising those muscles. Yeah. That's and a it, powerful lesson. And, for and it's, you know, listening. the first thing I felt when I stood up on the podium in Sarajevo, you know, getting an Olympic gold medal, what in the world? I always say that Olympic gold medal, what in the world? Um, is that I'm the only one standing here, and that doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel good at all. I'm the only one standing here, and the people that made this happen, you know, some some aren't even in the building, but the ones that are in the building are in the crowd, and they they should be celebrated in this moment. Amen. I don't want to let this moment get away from us. There's people listening that I know are crushed with some disappointments. You know, I, I always describe a disappointment as an appointment that shows up in your life that you didn't make. You didn't want it. And I want to just say a quick prayer that they'll know the invitation of God and His grace. Father, I thank you for every person listening. Lord, you, no detail is hidden from you, no circumstance. And those, Lord, those who are disappointed today, they're broken and hurt, and the pressure seems more than they can bear. I pray that in the midst of that, they would hear that still small voice that says you love them, that you have a plan for their future and something good for them. I pray that not one of them would give up, but that they would say yes to you in a new way and begin to exercise those muscles of mercy and grace and determination and discipline that Scott has described that will bring them to your very best for their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I've been talking today with um, a fellow Nashvilleian, <laughs> yeah. Scott Hamilton. So if you hear a little bit of a hillbilly accent, his isn't as bad as mine. But Getting there. Working but, uh, on it. Well, we'll keep helping you. We'll coach <laughs> you on y'all and all those good things. <laughs> all y'all is my favorite. How's your mom and him? But I want to thank you for all the things you do. You know, we bump on into it. one another around Middle Tennessee a lot. And you are always a bright light in any space you're in. Well, thank you. And I thank you for that. Well, I'm honored to be in your company, sir. And thank uh, you for bringing so many people to the Lord and just keeping them there. And thank you for helping me know what a triple axle is. Oh yeah, three and a half. Here we go. (laughs) Thank you for listening to the Alan Jackson Ministries podcast and for your generosity in helping us get these messages out there for others. So if you feel led, check the link in the description to give. But until next time, stay encouraged. Stay encouraged.